2, starting with verse number 15. Luke 2 and verse number 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, thank you for every person here in this place. I ask a blessing on every person that they'll receive a wonderful blessing from you because they have obeyed and because they saw the need to worship you and honor you for who you are. We pray for those who suffer. We have another person who has passed away. We pray for the Clifford Johnson family. And we also pray for Roscoe Blackburn, who's having a very difficult time uh, this week. And I pray that you'll bless him so that he can gain his strength and you just take care of him and give him another day, give him another week among us, another month, because we know that he hasn't been well at all. We pray for all the sick, those suffering in any way. Many are in the hospitals and the nursing homes. Some are just confined to their homes sick. I pray, dear God, that you'll help them. And now, Lord, as we continue with our service, bless us so that the Christ can receive the glory he's worthy of. In his name I pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Bob has asked for a little help in the singing department, and I'm what they came up with. So uh, uh, if you will bear with us, uh, uh, our piano player is the best in the country. He'll tell you that. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're going to start off with 229. We'll do the first and last verse. I heard about old story how a savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me I heard about of his precious blood upon me. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and fought me with his redeemed. Ere I knew him, 
do good. Our, uh, our uh, communion hymn is going to be 289. And uh, if there's anyone here uh, who wishes to take communion with us and uh, didn't pick up a packet as they came in, if you'll raise your hand, uh, want to be brought to your seat. Okay. All right, we'll do all three verses of 289. like to read from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 7 nevertheless there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress in the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan the people walked in darkness, have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light was dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire, and for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
Prince of Peace. Out of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is talking about our Lord and Savior, a child of hope. With just one word, nevertheless, Isaiah erases all of the gloom of darkness over the earth and foresees the dawn of a great light, bringing hope even to those who live in the land of the shadow of death. And at this time, Israel was in darkness. It was a dark time for them. The Syrians was being going to invade them. There was a, a lot of hardship, and they kind of forgot who created them and kind of went to the opposite direction. But here this says how true to the character of God. Not even the darkest gloom can keep the light of his presence from shining, even upon those who live in the land of the shadow of death. At the 1989 World Congress of Evangelism, or Louisiana II, in Manila, testimonies from Christians around the world were highlighted by the witness of a Chinese believer who had been in prison for his faith. Demeaned as a human being and isolated from human contact, his cell was in a dark dungeon and his work assignment was to clean the sewers deep in the underground darkness. He told of standing up to his knees in human waste, going about his repulsive work. But against the stench and pollution of the sewer, he began to sing. He sang the song in the garden. The part that the captives heard was this, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. When his captors heard this, they realized they could neither break his spirit nor put out the brightness of his song. So they released him to tell his story far and wide. Needless to say, wherever he went, revival followed. Village after village came to Christ. As the capstone for Isaiah's encouragement, Isaiah's encouragement, the Lord gives him the privilege of seeing his purpose for bringing the light of joy the peace of nations, the hope of salvation to every corner of the earth, including the Galilee of the Gentiles. This is the other side of the promise of his presence as Emmanuel. Isaiah had extended the devastation of war to every nation on earth because of evil, where it flares up and spreads in the anger of his presence. By the same token, the light of redemptive hope brightens and, and spreads to every corner of the earth from the glory of his presence. How will this vision come to pass? God honors Isaiah's faithfulness by lifting the veil of revelation on the future and showing him the royal child of hope who is to be born. Quite in contrast with the world at war, the child will govern a world in peace where judgment and justice prevails. One name is not enough to identify this child of the future. Rather, the child of five names is introduced to us. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Some scholars claim that Isaiah borrowed these titles from Egyptian tombs where Pharaoh for pharaohs were honored with godly attributes of wisdom, power, eternal being, and peace. What empty words. The very fact that they are found in the tombs of dead pharaohs is its own witness against their validity. For the child of five names, there will be no death. 
Instead, he will be the conqueror of death and therefore the great light of hope that will shine upon all humans who live in the land of darkness under the shadow of death. This hymn of praise, inspired by the Gospel of John in chapter 20, may be read either as a eulogy looking back upon a royal personage or as an eschatology looking forward to the promise of David for a kingdom with no end. Only the most biased critics could contest the fact that the child of hope is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we have that same hope today. We know the tomb is empty, not like the Pharaohs. We have that promise of eternal life. Heavenly Father, to God, we thank you, Father, for this day. Dear Father, we are so thankful, Father, for each and every one, Father, that has an opportunity to make it here today. Father, we just pray, Father, that you bless them. Dear Lord, we know, Father, that this is a crucial point of our service. Dear Father, we know, Father, you left an example for us to do this upon the first day of the week, dear Lord. And Dear Lord, I just pray, dear God, as we assemble here today, dear Lord, that we could clear our minds of all earthly things, dear Lord, and, and look back to the significance of these emblems that we're about to partake of, dear Lord. Dear Lord, as we take this bread, dear Lord, let us remember that you said it was your body, and your body was broken upon the cross in so many different ways, dear Lord, and even before you got to the cross. And Dear Lord, we, we know, Father, with, without the love, from you, dear Lord, that we would have no hope. In Jesus' name, I pray you may take the bread. Prepare your cup. And let us pray. Father, as we continue in prayer, we are so thankful, Father, to come together this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, may we recognize the cup as representing the blood of Jesus. To know, Father, that every ounce of blood in Jesus' body was poured out upon the earth. And God, that's significant because salvation is for everyone. God, we're thankful for your word and how it instructs us and encourages us and to know uh, what we need to do to become Christians and to be able to sustain our Christian lives. And God, being around this table is one of those ways. Father, we're thankful for everyone here. Ask that as we go through this week that you give us the strength we need to overcome the temptations of this world, to know you're always with us. Please strengthen us and encourage us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. You may partake of the cup.
feeding good Christian fear for sinners hear the silent word is pleading nail spears shall pierce him through the cross be born for me for you hail hail the word made flesh the babe the son of mary so bring him incense gold and myrrh come peasant king to own him the king of kings salvation brings let loving hearts enthrone him raise raise the song on high the virgin sings her lullaby joy joy for christ is born the babe the son of mary thank you susan and thank you eddie both were very beautifully done both the devotion and the song. Our message series up until Christmas is Characters of Christmas. Last week we looked at the wise men. Now we're going to examine the people who lived on the bottom level of the social stature. We looked at the Kings, the three kings, who as they're sometimes called in the Christmas song, we don't know how many wise men there were because uh, we assume there were three because there were three gifts given, but it could have been more than that. But we know that they were people of high stature socially. Now we're going to see those people of low stature socially. We had a wonderful lesson this morning by Jason about King David fighting Goliath. And then it was pointed out that he felt that one of his qualifications in fighting the giant was his ability as a shepherd. The strength he had to ward off all the wild animals that were going to kill the sheep. And how even when a wild animal already was going after a sheep and had it in his mouth, he'd run after it and grab it and save it from the mouth of the perpetrator or the predator before it could be killed. And we look at a shepherd like that. He wrote the shepherd's song, the 23rd Psalm. And we normally think of shepherds as being like David. High status. Even though it was a job that was difficult, it was a job that demanded a lot of uh, dedication because you were there to save those sheep and whatever it took, you would do it. It took strength. It took hours out in the cold night. And you would think a great deal of regard would be given to a shepherd. A great deal of honor would be given to a shepherd. But during the time of Christ, it was just not true. Shepherds did not have that kind of status, even though we think that they would. According to the law of that day, a shepherd was not even 
allowed to testify in court. Uh, a shepherd was looked down upon. And so we're going to look here at their story briefly. But one of the greatest things about this is even though that they were looked down upon socially, they weren't looked down upon by God. God elevated them. God gave them a position higher than the religious people of the day. And we're going to notice something about these good shepherds. Let's read, first of all, the text, Luke 2, verses 8 through 14. Luke 2, 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rest. Let's go to God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these beautiful words. And I pray that you'll bless these words so that they will sink into our hearts and that we will learn lessons about joy and dedication and hope. I pray, dear God, that we will understand more completely what you're trying to tell us in your word that we will use whatever you tell us to be better Christians and to serve others, and especially to honor the Lord Jesus Christ who came to this earth to die for our sins. In his name I pray, amen. The characters of Christmas this morning are the shepherds. It says in verse 8, and there were shepherds. These men who, as I said, on a cold, possibly a winter's night, we don't know when Jesus was born, but it was probably a cold night. And here they were out in the fields, protecting their sheep, not expecting a heavenly visitor. That was the farthest thing from their mind. In fact, religion might have been the far, farthest thing from their minds. But they are going to hear the words of a heavenly visitor, an angel. Because it says in verse 9, an angel appeared. Now that is very significant. Angels had a big part at the birth of Jesus Christ. It was an angel who told Mary, she was going to have the child. He was even named. His name was Gabriel. The same Gabriel went to Joseph and said that Mary was going to have a son and that he should take her as his wife. So Joseph raised him. And then now we see that an angel, his name's not mentioned. It could have been the same angel. Gabriel, it's coming in person to the shepherds. And if it's the same messenger angel, he, this great archangel, is coming to these lowly shepherds. Now we notice in verse 9 the reaction that we would have as well. And they were terrified. Sometimes the New International Version clarifies things, and sometimes the... King James Version makes things more clear. In this case, I think the word terrified instead of afraid is probably a little more accurate to the original meaning of the word in Greek. Terrified is a very strong word for fear. And these shepherds who were 
very strong uh, men who were out in the wilderness, basically, in the mountains, in the rugged terrain, in all kinds of weather, defending these little sheep, probably for some other owner, more than likely not their own. They were hired help. They were terrified. You know, sometimes uh, we get afraid when we think about demonology. Uh, demons are real. They uh, existed at the time of Christ. They ex exist today. And uh, they're in a world all of their own. That world can be tapped. And that's why uh, there are warnings against witchcraft and other things dealing with demonology. So many people fear demons, and they should. You sh we should have a healthy fear, just like we have a healthy fear of anything else dangerous. But yet, when a heavenly visitor comes, it seems like we also fear. Moses was afraid when God came to him. Mary was afraid. Uh, Joseph was afraid. I would be afraid when this happened. You're talking about something high and holy and set apart uh, coming among us uh, who are sinners. So they were terrified. But notice to these shepherds, verse 10 says, the angel had a very brief message. I bring you good news. They needed some good news. Things were dark for Israel, has been pointed out by our lesson uh, uh, teacher today. Very dark. Uh, they, they were being ruled by Rome. They weren't an independent country anymore like they once were under King David. They were being ruled by the Roman Empire. They had wicked leaders like Herod that we referred to last week. Herod tried to make peace with the Israelites, the people in Israel, because he was appointed by the Roman government. He even rebuilt the temple and made it very beautiful with all the gold and all the tapestries. And he thought that that would endear the people to him, but they hated him. And we know he was very wicked. Even before killing the little babies, having them killed. We knew that he killed a lot of members of his own family because of his horrible jealousy. So it was a dark, dark time. People were awaiting the Messiah. Uh, they just weren't looking in the right places. To them, the Messiah was going to come very majestically. He would be coming in a way to destroy all the enemies of Rome and the people that were harming their country. They had an altogether different view of what was supposed to happen. Even though Isaiah prophesied, as we heard it read uh, today in our devotion from Isaiah, he talked about that he would come, his name would be Wonderful Counselor, uh, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Uh, it was Isaiah who said he'd be born of a virgin. There were other prophets that said he would even be born in Bethlehem in a manger. And, and it seemed like it just sort of went over everybody's head. They really weren't expecting the Messiah to start out as a baby. But he became human so that he can become like one of us so that we can understand God. It's hard enough to understand God because he's so big. He's too big for us. So God became little so that we could see him as a human. And this same human, as was pointed out already, uh, could feel and fear and be tempted and feel pain and all the things that we do so that nowhere along the way could we say to God anymore, we don't understand what I'm going through because he sure did understand because of the way he had to go through horrible things on this earth. So the angel is bringing good news. That's the meaning of the word gospel, good news. And one thing about the shepherds, you'll see in verse 
10 again, that the angel said this good news is to all, A, L, L, the people, all the people. So it's not just for religious people. It's not just for a certain color of people or people in a circum certain circumstances of life. It's for every single person. Then we see something else in verse 11 that the angel tells us. A Savior has been born. A Savior has been born. As I said, they weren't expecting their Messiah to be born. They were just expecting him to open the skies and come to the earth and reign as a king over the whole earth. But no, he was born into a family. He would eventually have a kingdom that would go over the whole earth. But his kingdom is right now over the whole earth. Maybe not strong in every places of the earth, but it's all over the earth. And this kingdom is made up of people like you and me who accepted him as their savior and who obeyed him and became Christians. So he is our savior. And he's the savior of every person yet who wants to claim him. And that's why we present this message to the world. Sometimes there's criticism among religious people. I can understand the point of view because of the commercialization of Christmas, even because of the, the holiday itself as being identified with certain heathen holidays. The, the Catholic Church tried to clean up the uh, origin of Christmas in its, in, in, of course it wasn't Christ's name associated with, but there was a heathen holiday in which uh, Christmas was uh, a substitute for, and so many religious people say, well, let's not even observe it, because it is a human man-made holiday. Uh, God did not command it. Uh, for example, God commanded us to do what you and I did this morning, uh, make a central place of worship to gather to honor Christ through communion. But no, people would rather not do that. We'd rather spend a month or two months getting ready for a man-made holiday. We'd rather spend all that time and all that money uh, giving gifts to one another, uh, not to God, but to one another. Now, am I putting down the holiday? No, I'm not. If there's anybody... If anybody can be drawn to Christ by the emphasis that we put on Christmas, the more power to it. Yeah, I'm just so glad that people like us can say this is what the holiday is about. Uh, there was a, uh, a story I read many years ago uh, <clears throat> about a man, <clears throat> or in fact a group of people, uh, going into a small town. I was talking to Betty, and most of us have very fond memories years ago, whether in a small town or a large town. Uh, we lived near a small town. That's where we shopped, and it was wonderful at Christmas going there and seeing all the stores, seeing all the <clears throat> decorations in the windows. We had big windows and manger scenes and all kind of stuff, and I we enjoyed that. Then Dad would take us to Akron, Ohio, where they had great big stores, and a lot of decorations, and it was even more uh, beautiful than our little town that we uh, lived in. But there was a story about a, a group of people who were very uh, focused on this one particular window because it, it was just so original uh, to the meaning of Christmas. It just had all of the scenes of the manger, and uh, it was just beautiful. And these people were standing in awe of it. And uh, undoubtedly, this actually happened, what was said by this man. Uh, he spoke up, and he just kind of grunted a little bit. He said, uh, uh, they ruined Christmas with religion. So, you know, he liked all the lights and the sparkle, but he didn't like the whole meaning of it. Now, we know the meaning of it. 
And we know it has to do with a Savior, not just a little baby in a manger, but a baby who grows up and goes to the cross and becomes a Savior. And that's the emphasis we always want to make. Many of you have, ladies in particular, have none. Betty has one, has sweaters or, or shirts that, that say uh, Jesus is the reason for the season. And that's what our responsibility is, to always remind people of the reason. And uh, I'm not opposed to the beauty of it. I'm not opposed to the decorating. I'm not opposed to the giving. Uh, as long as we as Christians especially uh, give our share to the Lord. It's all right to give to one another, especially the needy. Uh, but let's give our share to the Lord, too. Then we see something else about verse 11 that I've already emphasized a great deal. A Savior has been born. He is the Messiah. All of you who are baptized believers in Christ stood before somebody and made this statement that we call the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When you said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, you are saying, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Because Christ is the Greek word for the Jewish word, Messiah. So we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, which is to come, which was prophesied by every prophet in the Old Testament. And then we're going to close with this. And I hope that you and I will do uh, what these shepherds did. These men of low esteem by their community, but in high esteem by God. In verse 17, it says regarding the shepherds, they spread the word. When they had this experience with this supernatural being, this angel, which told them about the first Christmas, then they wanted to tell others about it. They spread the word the word. Each year and each week when we commune and each year when we do our personal goals for the new year, we call them resolutions, but I call them goals. One of them should be to spread the word. One of them should be I know as a church we try to do this. We try to get together and come up with ideas of how our church can do a better job of spreading the word and reaching other people. But it should also be a very personal thing. How can this year I personally share the gospel with more people? Now, it'll be different for everybody because you're unique. I'm unique. Your method will be different. You know, there was this preacher, I liked him, said, he, he had a, a big following, and uh, he, uh, a lot of people came to his church. And some, uh, another minister was talking about him to somebody. He said, well, I don't like him. And uh, uh, they said, uh, well, what, what don't you like? Uh, they said, we don't like his methods. Uh, and then someone said, well, uh, what's your methods? He said, I don't think I have any. The preacher said, I like mine better. So we all have different methods. Uh, we all have different ways of reaching people for Christ because we're all unique. We're all from different backgrounds. There's people going to listen to a coal miner before they listen to a preacher. It never worked in the mine. There's people that's going to uh, listen to a college professor or a doctor or somebody in the uh, medical field before they'll listen to me because they many times have confidence in those people, especially when they're Christian people. Some people, some students will listen to other students more quickly than they will listen uh, to a, 
almost 80 year old preacher because because you're with them they see you you're you're around them all the time they can see what you do what you don't do and you can spread the word and it's not as difficult as you think it's not as difficult as you think it's simply a matter of loving Jesus more we talk about what we love, don't we? That's what we do. We talk about what we love. You people love to talk about your grandchildren. And I like to hear the stories. Uh, some of you like to talk about your automobiles. I like cars too. We, we talk about things that we love. Uh, if we love our mates, we like to talk about them and the the, the stories in their lives and what they mean to us or your children uh, or your neighbor, anybody or anything that we like, we talk about. Now, if we start loving the Lord with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls, then he's going to ooze out of us. Uh, we're going to talk about him. We're going to mention him uh, in various situations that we find ourselves, whether it be our personal friends or our family or maybe people in public that we've never met. Sometimes the occasion arises that you can share your faith. Let's spread the word in 2024. So, you think that you ain't much? Well, the people on the day when the shepherds were watching their flocks didn't think they were much either. But God did. God thought they were so special that he didn't even tell the leaders at the temple in Jerusalem that Jesus was born, even though it was five miles away. He told these lowly shepherds. And they went hurriedly and obeyed. Now you and I can do the same thing. We can trust and obey. And I pray that as you ponder today what you're going to do for God as for this coming year, that you will recollect that day when you became a Christian. I can remember it so well. All of us can remember it so vividly. We need to go back to that day because it was the day that we really wanted to do something for God. If we ever want to do something for God, it was that day. That's when it all began. Let's think about that day and let's think about can we ever get that enthusiasm back, that love back, that, that gratitude back for him doing what he did for us. But if you've not yet experienced that and you want to, I pray that your faith is strong enough to lead you to confess the Lord. I pray that your faith is strong enough to lead you to the baptistry that you might be immersed. And I pray your faith is strong enough to keep you faithful after you make that step. So let's stand now and we'll talk about that step in verse, I mean, Song number 636, verse 1, only a step. Do verses 1 and 3. Mm. 